All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to, yeah, a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, we're so happy that you could be here and you could join us as we get to sing to our God today, as we get to hear from Him and hear from His Word. And um, yeah, we're just so thankful that you're here. And we actually just, I wanted to start this morning just, to, uh, yeah, to quiet our hearts before we enter into worship with, with Scripture. And so we're actually going to read from Hebrews 4. And I thought this is a really, and I love this verse because it just speaks of who Jesus is and just speaks directly about him. This is what it says. Therefore, since we have a high great priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been emptied in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So that, we, we, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And that's really what I want us to focus on before we begin in worship, is just let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I mean, I don't know sort of where you are in the week, whether it's been a great week or a hard week, but in both of those, we can approach the throne of God, we can approach Jesus, and we can ask for mercy and grace, and we can just say, blessed be his name. And so I'd invite you to stand today, if you're able, as we sing, as we honor and worship our God. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. 
songs that are written there, and, and we're so thankful to the authors that wrote these songs, but we can also sing our own song to God. And I know sometimes that's maybe not the most comfortable for everyone, and so what I'd encourage you is we're just going to play instrumentally for a bit, for a couple of minutes, and I encourage you, whether it be if you want to sing just quietly to yourself, or even just to pray, it's one of those moments where we can, in, together as a collective, just come together. Because it's great to worship and, and be and pray when you're alone, but, but it's also amazing when we're together and we can just rest as a group, as his church in his spirit. So we're just going to pray, yeah, just, just play instrumental. And I encourage you, yeah, just to, to pray, to sing, to sit down, just to, like I said, maybe it's been an easy week, maybe it's been a hard week, but just to rest. To rest in Jesus' name, to rest in who he is, that he is our great high priest. He emphasizes with us that he loves us, that he died for us, and he rose again for us. that just leads us into our, our next song and king of my heart and, and I love and we're going to do an ending and it may not be the most familiar but there's actually an ending to the song king of my heart and it, it's a great song because it talks about how you are good how God is so good and that he's never going to let us down I would say he's never going to let us go but it's amazing at the there's an ending and it says when the night is holding on to me God is holding on 
And I love that line, the idea of when darkness is holding on to me, God is holding on. In my struggles, in my pains, God is holding on. And it also shows who God is, that even in our joys, God is holding on. That God clings to us as we cling to him because we are his creation. We are made in his image and he loves us. So as we sing King of My Heart and as we end that way, I just thought it would be a nice way to end before we get to the rest of our service. But And maybe right now you're struggling. Is God good? I encourage you to, to read scripture, to pray, and to meet with others and, and learn that even in the hardships, God is good. That even in those hardships, we never have to do it alone, but we do it with our King, with our Lord and Savior. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good,
okay, everyone. Am I on here? Yeah, it's okay. I just had, I think he passed out, but he's okay. <laughs> We're just going to let him sit here for a second. You can, you can all have a seat for a second here. Katie, just let us know if you need a hand, okay? Is that your last song? Sorry. <laughs> it is, okay. All right, you guys can go. That's good. So I think that was just... William up here, just so you know, because I know some of you can't see what's happening, but I think he just had a little fall, but everything's okay. We'll help him up in a sec. Oh, there we go. All right, let's pray for, let's pray for Will as he goes. Make sure everything's okay. Thank you guys for helping out with that. Father, thank you that uh, even when unexpected things happen, we can lift up our friends to you. We pray for William. We pray for Robert and Katie too, and just thank you for this wonderful family. We pray that uh, that William would feel better, that uh, that he wouldn't be hurt too bad. I'm not sure exactly what happened there, um, but God, I pray that whether it's his nose or his lip or something like that, that uh, uh, took a bit of a hit. God, I pray that uh, you would uh, bless the people who are helping him right now, help them know the right things to do in a time when it can be kind of uncomfortable. We're all gathered here together, but we look to you, God. Thank you that you are the one in charge of this service, and we leave the rest of this service in your mighty hands. And we all lift up the DeCroon family and everyone together. We all pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for praying with me there. I think looks like he just took a, a bit of a tumble during the song there. So we have, uh, we have our service today before us, and I know this can kind of be distracting, distracting and I want to acknowledge that. Sometimes when um, something unsettling happens, it gets our attention. And I don't know exactly what God is doing today in the service, but he wants us to be in a slightly different frame of mind than all of us were going to be a moment ago. So whatever God is up to today, let's first of all keep praying for the practical needs that that William's just fine, everything's okay over there. Uh, But let's also take a moment and say, God, what are you saying to me right now? What what am I supposed to be paying attention to at this moment? And you know what? God's going to be speaking to us through the music. Some of you, I hope you can remember what Pastor Brian was already acknowledging there, that some of us are coming from weeks that have been really hard. Some of us are coming from weeks that have been fantastic. Some of us are coming into this service right now, and as we were praying before this service even began, some of us are just in the rush of life to try and be here and sit here and pay attention. I know that we've got people in the nursery right now who, you know, I'm talking to you, but they're probably not even able to pay attention to me. (laughs) And there's people here, you have things on your minds, and you know what, hi, I'm here, you know, and you're probably not able to pay attention to me either sometimes. But I hope that whatever happens today, that God is getting your attention, whether that's through me, whether that's through some other aspect of the service, because there's still other things that we are going to do today. We are going to hear the word preached. We are actually just going to talk about some announcements right now in just a second. Um, and we're going to hear scripture read. So whatever God is trying to say to you today, have an open mind and an open heart, because if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Spirit of God in you. Amen? That means you can pay attention to what He is saying to you today. Now, I'm going to go over a few announcements. I'll invite Henry up in just a second. Uh, The first thing I want to make sure all of you guys know about is that on Sunday, May 29th, Teen Challenge is going to be joining us. Two things I want to say about Teen Challenge being here. First of all, uh, when Teen Challenge comes, uh, they're going to be sharing in the service for the message part of the service, and I know you'll all be here, and you can look forward to that. It'll be fantastic, but they're also going to be staying for our class session afterward, and we're just going to be all sitting up here, 
Uh, I'll, I'll be sitting with them. I'll have a couple questions to ask them, but this is a really valuable time where we can ask some questions of these guys who have been in Teen Challenge or are in it or have come through it. I know that there are different stories in our own congregation, in our own families, where there are people who have maybe been through Teen Challenge, or maybe there are people in your family struggling with addictions, young men or young women who are nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, children of yours. And this could be a really valuable time to ask a couple questions of guys who have come through some of those very dark days. So I want to encourage all of you to stick around for this Q&A, even if you don't have a question, um, but be prepared. Maybe jot a question down so that when you stick around after the service on the 29th, uh, that you can ask these guys, maybe tell me a little bit more about um, how you realized you needed help, or what it was like in those first days, or is there any advice you would have for me as a family member to encourage one of my own family members who maybe needs to take a step toward Teen Challenge, whatever it might be. Uh, this is going to be a really, really cool Q&A. Um, it could be a very valuable time for a lot of you, so I want to encourage you to remember that. The other thing is just that when Teen Challenge comes, we always take up a love offering for them. Uh, it just means that we're going to have a special collection. Um, whether you give online or in person, we'll make sure that online there is a spot that you can have. Um, I guess I'm telling Bruce right now um, that if you use Tithely or something, you can give to Teen Challenge by selecting that or just come ready on that Sunday. Um, we'll make sure that uh, Maybe we'll have some envelopes ready. That'll probably be the easiest thing. We'll have envelopes that we'll give out to everybody. So if you have something, a check or some cash that you want to put aside and make sure it goes to Teen Challenge, then you'll be able to do that on the morning of the 29th. Uh, the next announcement we have up here, uh, also on the 29th, just so you know, we are having a worship night. That'll be happening here in the sanctuary. Uh, that'll happen at 7 p.m. Pastor Brian is going to lead us in an evening of song, prayer. It's a time for you to sit and reflect on what God is doing in your life and to worship and to sing and to lift your hands or clap your hands if you're comfortable with that or just to sit and meditate on his word and worship him. So that's the 29th at 7 p.m. Also, some of you have got to come out to one Parent Connection Night. We did one back in March. The next one is coming up at the end of June. It's going to be another Friday night. This one has a bit broader scope, so we're inviting parents with children of any age to come out. We're going to have a chance to share a little bit about what it looks like to parent through the little years, through the middle years, through the older years of adult children. There's going to be a great time to share some encouragement, some wisdom, um, to ask for some questions of people in different chapters. I think this is going to be a really great night. I also want you to know if you have parents of older kids, you're not just showing up to be the panelist for the evening. You know, it's not like you're expected to answer all the questions. Um, I think it, it needs to go both ways, right? Because parents with older kids, some of you have grandchildren, right? And to be able to talk about parenting or taking care of some of these little kids in probably, I'm guessing, if, you, if your kids are 40 or 50 <laughs> or 30 even, you raised your kids in a very different age than your grandkids are getting raised in or your great-grandkids. So this could be a really great evening. Anyone who is basically wanting to come out to the Parent Connection Night, if you are expecting or if your children are 60 years old, you are welcome to come out to this Parent Connection Night uh, happening on the 24th of June. Uh, just a reminder, we have the Summer at a Glance cards, which are at the back out there on the literature table. There's also a bunch of other great things out there. So if you're ever just wandering around after the service for a second, go have a look at that literature table out there because there's some great information about things that are coming up in the church, uh, events that are happening even outside of the church sometimes. That's where you'll find some of the information about that. Uh, the last thing there is sports camp volunteers. Uh, now, I haven't talked to Brian really lately about this, so I don't know if we're still looking for billets, um, but I know we were last week. So if you are interested in hosting, uh, it'll probably be two guy coaches or two girl coaches is typically how it ends up happening. Uh, if you're interested in hosting, please come talk to you. You can talk to me or Pastor Brian. That would be perfect if you talk to him because he's overseeing all the volunteers and everything this year, as well as snacks or volunteers. I know some of you have reached out about this already. We're still looking for a few more. Our camp just keeps growing. This is by far the biggest sports camp that we will ever have run at our church. I think we're up to 76 registrations or something like that now, which is awesome. I think the biggest camp we've ever run up to this was like 56 or something like that. Maybe we had 60 last year, but it was just two days. So really exciting stuff going on in the church family. Thank you all for participating, for supporting. And when I say all, I mean we, we need you all to help as we get ready for this awesome sports camp this summer. 
I'm going to invite up Henry Verhoek, who's going to come and read our passage of Scripture for the morning. Thanks, Nate. If the mic is on, I'll do my best not to, uh, not to make a scene up here. This is always my paranoid part about coming up front, uh, and, and, and it's always unfortunate when something happens, but you never know when it could be. So the scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14, and just a little bit of context here, that after Christ had risen from the grave, Jesus appears to seven of the disciples. So that's a setting of John 21. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciples Jesus loved, then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had raised from the dead. Thank you, Henry, for reading God's word with us this morning. And before we get into it today, I'm going to invite any of our kids who are eager to make their way out to kids care to follow Pastor Brian. He is at the door ready for you guys. Have a wonderful time in kids' care. I think you are almost in the same part of the Bible that we're going to be talking about today. It's going to be close. While they make their way out to kids' care, if you have a Bible with you, you are welcome to turn to it because sometimes that is helpful. In fact, it's always helpful. John 21, if you have it on your phone or if you have it on a paper version, uh, 1 to 14 is what Henry read for us today. Now, before we get into that, as we continue talking about these two themes, first of all, I want to point out we've been talking about two themes over the past few weeks. Uh, I hope all of you have noticed that we've been staying very tight into the Easter stories. We've been sticking with the post-resurrection accounts, Jesus appearing to people, right? We, let me refresh your memory. We talked about, first of all, Jesus appearing in the garden to the women. We had Jesus, he was eager to meet them in the garden. Remember, that's what we were talking about, that he wanted to meet them. Then we talked about on the road to Emmaus, these two doubting disciples leaving Jerusalem after the events of the crucifixion and indeed the resurrection, yet they are on their way out, quitting. And Jesus goes and meets with them. And he encourages them, he teaches them. And by the time they're done meeting with Jesus and realize who it is, they are hightailing it back to Jerusalem. Last week we talked about how on the cross... Jesus was concerned about the relationships of the people that he loved. Jesus was actually building up his church, the family of God, from the very cross. As he hung there, if you remember, we talked about how he looked at his mom, said, behold your son, as he pointed out the disciple whom he loved. And then he said, that was John, and then he said to John, behold your mother. You get to know each other in this new relationship. You are now mother and child. You are a family. 
and Jesus is still in the work of building families. Amen? He's built up families for each one of us here, families in ways that maybe we never would have expected, just like I'm sure John and Mary didn't expect to be family in the way they were, but when God puts together a family, it's a good thing, amen? So we have looked at these things, uh, the Easter themes, but we've also been getting the kind of picture of the way God builds us into community. God is making us a family. We need the people around us. We aren't together with those people in our families, our, our close spiritual families, by accident. God builds us together. So as we explore these two themes, we're also getting this picture of the kind of God we serve. We serve a God who is not a bully God. He is not the kind of God who just rams through life and makes you do exactly what he wants to do, even though his plan will come about in the end. We serve the kind of God who goes and meets with his wayward people. We serve the kind of God who goes and waits on us stubborn people. We serve the kind of God who takes his time, even when it drives us nuts, and we think, God, why aren't you doing this faster in my life? We serve a God who doesn't just juggernaut through life. Instead, he invites us into something much deeper and richer, relationship. We're going to be looking at that again today. Because I think over and over again in the scriptures, we see God's incredible patience and grace, even, and I might say especially, in dark and uncertain times. I mean, how dark and uncertain can you get when you're talking about Jesus hanging on the cross, building together a spiritual family? Yet he is still there working in the midst of the crucifixion itself. How many of us can say amen to the fact that we still live in dark and uncertain times? Amen? Can I get an amen to that? These are dark and uncertain times, but it means all the more that we should be aware that Christ is the one who enters into these times and ministers in our hearts, even in the very darkest places. We've all heard the Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Not because, for thou hast taught me a nice thing to remember and mantra to say to myself, thou art with me. Or as we would say it today, you're with me. God is with you in whatever dark and uncertain manifestation of this crazy world that you are in right now. God is with you. So, we all have to admit, though, that like the stories we've been seeing throughout these post-resurrection events, and I guess last week was still in the middle of the crucifixion, we all still make mistakes. I mean, that's the context of the stories that we were looking at. For the most part, it's people who are doubting, people who are wandering away. And today, we find it happening again. Jesus is drawing these disciples toward himself who were floundering. No pun intended. I mean, they're fishing flounder. But they were floundering out there in their faith, as well as in the boat all night, not catching any fish. Jesus calls them out, but I want us to notice something. We're going to work through three themes today. Jesus calls them out, but he doesn't call them out with a direct call. He doesn't say, come over here. Come to me, I'm Jesus. He calls them in a different kind of way, but it still gets their attention, amen? Let's look at that together, okay? The passage context today that we were just looking at, these, this is another story, and if you haven't caught on, there's a bunch of stories in the Bible, especially after the resurrection, resurrection, where people don't recognize Jesus. He keeps showing up, and people don't know who he is. And once again, there's a figure standing on the shore, but nobody's paying any attention to that guy standing there. The disciples are out in their boat. They, you can put this picture up, yeah. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is actually the Sea of Galilee. It was and still is actually a rather quiet and peaceful place, at least when there's, it's not full of tourists. Right? And if you ever get the chance to go there, go there. That'll be great. And if you get the chance to go there at 6 in the morning and watch the sunrise, and hopefully not everyone else had that idea, even better. But maybe some of you know what it's like to have a cottage on a lake or go camping beside a lake, and you stand there on the shore, you see the sunrise, you, see, you feel the water lapping against your feet on the stones or on the sand of the beach, and you know that this is a very special moment of the day 
when it is so peaceful and so calm. Yet the disciples have been out pulling an all-nighter fishing trip. And they're not very far from the shore. It says they're about 100 yards from shore. That's about a football field from the shore. And these disciples are out there, and they're probably not just basking in the glory of a beautiful morning. They're exhausted, and they're frustrated. Now, just so you know, pulling an all-nighter fishing was not actually an unusual thing. It was a very normal thing, because when you pulled an all-nighter and had a good catch of fish, you got the best price at the market when you took them there in the morning because they were still fresh. Instead of selling stinky fish that you had caught the previous afternoon and had to wait till the next morning's market. So this was the habit of fishermen, yet they had turned up empty-handed. It says in verse 4, if you look there, that the sun was just rising. It was very early in the morning. The disciples were out there on their small fishing boat. And I want to pause there because I want to ask you a question. This is the first point. Are you running? Are you running? Well, what does running have to do with the disciples being out on the boat in the morning? Why had the disciples gone fishing on this particular morning? I, I imagine that if you went out there and asked those disciples, why are you guys out fishing here? There's seven guys led by Simon Peter who had this idea to go out fishing, and he says, you guys want to go? And they said, okay. I think you'd probably find seven different confused answers about why they're even out there. They have just been through the wildest three years that any human being could have ever lived. And here they are, seven guys out on a boat, fishing all through the night. Perhaps, as theologian Tom Wright says, it was the right motivation, but they had made the wrong judgment call. They had a good reason, but the problem is it isn't what they were meant to be doing. Have you ever wondered what you are meant to be doing? Have you ever thought, what I'm doing is not bad, I have a good reason to do what I'm doing, but is this what I'm meant to be doing? Simon Peter, he wanted to get on with life. He wanted to do something. He was waiting, he was stuck in this in-between time. So he and a few others went back to the world they knew because they had been fishermen. How many of you have ever gone back into something comfortable when you don't know what to do? You go back to the same old because there's security in the same old. There's predictability in the same old. I also bet that the families of these seven guys had probably been a little bit bemused when they came back after the events of that Passover weekend when Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Because not everybody automatically became a Christian after that. I bet a lot of these guys had communication with their family and it went something like, you guys need to like smarten up, get a real job, support your families, go back to the fishing business before it completely falls apart, Peter. They probably had some pressure like that. Have you ever experienced some pressure like that? To go out there and do something practical instead of something you feel the Holy Spirit maybe has been prompting you and leading you to do? Why do we have this, this division? Why is it sometimes this is practical and this is what God wants me to do? And why do we feel like they don't line up in our definitions? I mean, going out, if I said, and maybe you felt this way, if I said, go out, get a real job, earn a good income, provide for your family, that, that strikes a sort of practical nerve in all of us, right? It probably should. Have you ever greeted someone else's realization that they need to go out there on a limb for God and do something and think, they need to grow up. That's not a good idea. They should just earn some money, buy a house, and settle down. Even though they had already seen Jesus twice, the resurrected Jesus was alive and active, yet the disciples succumbed to this pressure. The pressure of the moment. The pressure to be practical in this worldly definition. How many of us have felt this pressure? And you realize when you look at the disciples how strong this pressure is. The disciples who had been with Jesus, watched him work miracles, seen him raised from the dead, and they still go back to fishing when they don't know what to do. So let's take a look here for a second at what's happening because they're choosing something that I'm going to say 
is secular in a moment when they are called to something spiritual. But let's define this word for a second, secular, because I think secular is a confusing word for us to look at. In our common cultural usage, the word secular has often come to mean something anti-Christian or unchristian. But the word secular itself is rooted not in the meaning of things that are unholy, that is, anti-Christian or unchristian. Secular is a word meaning temporary. Secular is a word that means temporary. Its meaning is rooted not in morality, but in time. Secular is a word that describes time. The opposite of secular is not Christian, as in do you listen to secular music or Christian music? The opposite of secular is eternal. Are you doing something of temporary value, or are you doing something of eternal value? And is it of eternal value that is good for you? Or is it of eternal value that is sending you down the wrong path? The real question is, are you hiding in the secular? Are you hiding in the secular? We talked about, are you running? But what we're really asking is, are you hiding in the secular? Not whether something is good or bad, because the secular thing you could be hiding in might be good or bad morally. We cannot avoid secular things in our lives, but we can choose to hide in them and hide from God, or we can choose a different path. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve disobey God. They eat the fruit from the tree they weren't supposed to eat, right? We're all on the same page there. After they eat the fruit from the tree, what do they do when they hear God? They hide. They hide. They try to make a barrier between themselves and God. They try and find a way out of the eternal relationship with God, and they cut themselves off and they hide. Are you hiding in the secular? Well, what is the secular, Pastor Nate? Money is secular, right? Time itself. Property is secular. The things we value in our society the most. Our occupations are secular. Almost all of them. Even mine is, in a sense, secular, in the sense that when Jesus comes back and everything is made new and the world is right, you don't need a pastor like this because Jesus is just going to be there. You know what? So in a sense, even some, a lot of what I do is secular work. Secular as in it pertains to this age. It pertains to things that pass. It's not bad, but it pertains to things that pass. We are not meant to hide in the secular. We are not meant to build walls between secular and eternal. In fact, all our work All the work that God has called you to do as a builder, as a nurse, as an accountant, as a factory worker, whatever it might be, all our work has a kingdom value. We're going to talk about how we get there in a moment. All our work has kingdom value because God wants to work through everything that we do in our days to bring his blessing into the world, to show his kingdom way of living, to show his kingdom values, things of ultimate and important and eternal value at work in our crazy, non-moral, unmoral workplaces and lives. God is calling his kingdom into being in your life. He wants to work through you to show justice and mercy in the way that you conduct your business and fulfill your job description. He is calling you to show those things in the relationships, every relationship that he puts in your life, whether it be with a coworker or a client or a customer or just someone on the street. He wants us to show his light into the darkness because we live in dark and uncertain times and the way God shines his light into dark and uncertain times is through his people out there doing secular work for the kingdom of God. 
How else can you be a light unless you are in that workplace, that factory, that hospital, whatever it might be? When we hide in the secular, we only have tiredness. We only have frustration. We don't show anything with the work of our hands. I mean, how many of us know that we have spent time in our lives and we have been like the disciples? They were out on the boat all night. They were trying to do something, trying to make something happen. But after toiling for hours, they had nothing to show and their nets were empty. How many of us have experienced something like that, but maybe we have checked the things off the to-do list, but we still feel empty because we were just living for the task. This happens all over the world. I mean, there are people who excel at their jobs, be they business people or athletes, and they don't know Christ. And all of that comes to feel like Nothing in the end because it all passes away. And I'm not going to do a sermon on Ecclesiastes, but I could right now. But we're not going to. We're going to stay here in John. But all of that stuff passes away if we do it just for the secular. If we insulate ourselves from the eternal value of the things God is calling us to, it all comes up empty in the end. So what's the solution? Like, am I going to call all of you today? Is Pastor Nate going to stand up here and say, you all need to quit your jobs, be like Pastor Brian and I, and go out and become pastors or missionaries because that's the only way to have a fulfilling life. I want to say emphatically, no, okay? Absolutely not because I want to eat tomorrow and I want to be able to go to the doctor when my leg is broken. Hopefully it doesn't get broken, but I want to go knowing that there's a doctor there at the hospital who works there. I want to know that there's a guy driving the snowplow in winter so that I can go to Stratford, right? We need each other to do the work that God has called us to do. But I think we've made a mistake in the church sometimes in the way we've talked about calling. Because calling is not something that just happens for Pastor Brian six years ago and for me nine years ago, or whenever it is, I'll let him tell his story sometime. It is not just a calling to full-time ministry when you draw your paycheck from a church or from a missions charity. Not to, not to belittle any of that work, but God does not just call one in 50 people. God is calling all of you into something. And this is what brings us to our next part of the story, the wordless call that we meet in John 21. The turning point for the men in John is not when they get a heavenly job description handed down to them from the sky or thrown, you know, attached to a rock from Jesus, you know, to, from the shore to them in the boat. It is when they hear when they hear the voice of Jesus and respond, something significant changes in their lives. Jesus does not say, hey, you idiots, you're not supposed to be out there fishing, you're supposed to be missionaries, get over here. What does Jesus do as he stands on the shore? He says to them, hey, friends, have you caught any fish? No? Well, why don't you try casting your net over here? Jesus actually enters into the secular occupation that they are trying to fulfill. I want us to notice that because you know what? I know John's purposes in telling this story are far beyond just this. In fact, he's setting up this powerful redemption story. And I encourage you, read a little bit farther this afternoon, not right now, this afternoon in this passage, and you'll see how this episode that we're talking about today actually leads into the most powerful personal story of redemption that we get in the Gospels, okay, with Peter. But in the moment, I want us to notice the way that Jesus calls them. Because he doesn't say, hey, get over here. And how many of us just wish, so often in our days, Jesus would just audibly from the shore yell to us, hey, stop doing that and do this instead, because this is what I want you to do. Have any of you ever had that happen in your life? I mean, that's awesome, because Jesus can do it, because he's standing right there on the shore. But he doesn't in this case, and the reality is he doesn't. In most cases, certainly in our daily rhythms, he's not doing that every day. Maybe he does that once in a while, just like he showed up for Paul on the road. and you know, All the lights and people going blind and everything, it's crazy. But that doesn't happen every time Jesus shows up and speaks to us. Here, he says to them, try catching fish this way. And you know what? What happens? What do they do? 
they say, well, who's this schmuck on the shore who's telling me how to fish? No, they just say, okay, we haven't caught anything. We'll give it a try. They obey. And Jesus rewards them. I don't think that they, I don't think they just happen to be fish there. I mean, no. Jesus rewards them. <laughs> Jesus is doing something in this moment, and their obedience is rewarded, and Jesus gets their attention. How? By blessing the secular work they were doing. I bet those fish got sold at the market. They weren't chumps who just left them on the shore there afterward. They took those to the market, and they did the rest of the fishermen's work that they were supposed to be doing. Jesus blessed them in their secular work, but he got their attention. He got their attention because they were hiding in it, and Jesus wanted to call them out of their hiding. The call is indirect, and that's the way Jesus is probably going to speak to you right now or later on today. The call is often indirect. When we're reading the scripture, let me just kind of clarify. When we're reading the scripture, you can often hear a direct call from Jesus. Something that is spoken in the scriptures by the word of God can speak to you, and you hear God's call directly in your life. A lot of the time in your day, though, you are not walking around. It's unsafe to drive with your nose in the Bible, okay? I'm just going to say it. You shouldn't be reading your Bible all the time. God is going to speak to you, prompt you, get your attention in different ways. How is he going to get your attention, and what might he be saying to you? Because God is going to speak to you, builders, carpenters. He's going to speak to you, professional drivers. And he's going to speak to you, retired people and students. He's going to speak to you in the midst of your day. He's going to get your attention. He's going to get your attention through hard work. He's maybe going to get your attention through blessing your work or stopping you from that work for a moment. He's going to get your attention because he wants you to do that work well or because he wants you to work with integrity and maybe you are not. Maybe he wants you to work with justice and mercy and he's trying to get your attention in some way. I don't know, but he's doing it all the time because there's never a time in our life where it's just secular. If we think it is, we're hiding in it. We need to offer every moment, whether you are, wa this morning when I walked to the office and I was thinking about this message, I was trying to think about how is God speaking to me right now? I'm just walking to the office. Like maybe you could call it exercise and that's the purpose of this time. I've got to get to the church somehow. But I said, God, like what, what could you possibly be trying to get my attention with right now as I'm walking to the church? And then it kind of just struck me, and I think it should this should strike us a lot, thankfulness. I'm walking down a peaceful, quiet street on a beautiful morning. There are birds flying over my head. There is so much to be thankful for as I'm walking there. And there was a call to relationship with Christ that I experienced just in that very simple way for a moment. I stopped, and I took the time, and I paid attention to the little thing that Jesus was calling me to indirectly. All of us are called by Jesus, no matter what you are doing as a career, as an occupation, to be full-time ministers. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are called to be a full-time minister, not just Brian and I. You're called to be a full-time minister because minister means servant. You are all called, along with me and Pastor Brian, to serve the kingdom of God in everything that we do. All of us have a calling on our lives to be full-time ministers. What that looks like for you, I can't specifically say. And it's not up to me. Jesus is the one who will say exactly what you need to hear, to know that you are called. Because calling you in full-time ministry to your job might mean doing your job really well. Maybe if your job is totally intrinsically tied to some form of injustice and you feel called to get out of it, maybe God is calling you out of that job. I don't know. And there's situations even where the job's good, but the environment is something is really messed up and you need to get out. Or maybe God is calling you to reform it and he's put you there for a reason. I don't know. But I know that God has called us in every aspect of our lives to render service to his kingdom. That means there is no part of counting numbers, inventory, processing payments, whatever you might do, that isn't part of honoring God by being just, by showing compassion, by being a hard worker, 
by honoring your boss and the people around you. Doing your job in this way is part of the calling each of us have, and it's part of Jesus' invitation every day in the wordless calls, the indirect calls, like what we see in our passage today, to let our attention be caught by the one who loves us and who is standing not far off and is guiding us if we'll pay attention. So, are you running? Are you hiding in the secular? Do you realize that Jesus is giving you this wordless call every day in every facet of your life to render service to the kingdom? What then? You work hard, you do your thing, and it's all good enough, right? Is that where the story ends? Is that where the three-point sermon ends? No, we still got one more point. Look, that is not where the story ends, okay? The story goes one step farther, and I love this part of the story because it's strange. Because the invitation after all of this is, come and eat. What? That's where the story ends up. A bunch of guys having breakfast. This is a great story. If you like breakfast, this is your kind of Bible story right now. We have, a, I have a word for you today. Don't try and go out now and just justify and spiritualize your own calling. This is not a message for you to just sit there in your seat and try and imagine ways to be more spiritual in whatever it is you do as you drive your tractor or whatever you might be going to do tomorrow when you go to work. I want you to learn to pay attention to what God is doing. And if we keep reading in our story, we find that Jesus does not just say, go be great fishermen. Jesus is, without words, but absolutely drawing them to himself. God has not just made you for work. The great beginning of the Bible gives us two huge themes about time. Some of it is devoted to work, and some of it is devoted to rest. God wants a relationship with you. He wants you to come and sit with him. The disciples had been out all night. They'd achieved nothing. Maybe you are in a season of your life where you don't know what you're achieving right now. Maybe things are happening, maybe the tires are moving, but you're stuck in the mud and you're just stuck there spinning and you don't know what God wants you to be doing. I want to encourage you. Jesus is absolutely drawing you toward himself, even if you don't hear or recognize him totally clearly. His presence is is never far from you, just like he was not far from the disciples. He loves you. He is there to provide for you. Notice how the fit, the, he blessed the disciples with fish, right? How many? Anyone remember? 153. Nice. Yeah, you guys have great memories. He blessed them with 153 fish. How many did Jesus need of those 153 to cook them breakfast? None. He already had the fish. He was already cooking them. Jesus provided for them. He gave them the 153 fish. I already said that. And he also gave them breakfast. I don't know where he got these fish. I guess he had been fishing while it was still dark himself. I don't know. But Jesus provided for them. Jesus can provide for you. You have a calling and a purpose in your life to do good work, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. But don't for a second kid yourself that you are the one who sustains yourself, that you provide for yourself. Jesus provides for you. Jesus is drawing you toward himself through work, through his provision. Maybe you are at a moment in your life when you are out on the boat away from the shore like the disciples. And right now, this morning, this afternoon, this season, you need to scan that shoreline and look for the figure standing there not far off. You need to listen to where that voice is coming from. Or you just need to listen to hear that voice. John had a deep love for Jesus. John was sitting there on that boat. And when he heard that voice, I don't know if something kind of twigged in his mind, but they listened. They all obeyed. They, They caught the fish. And in that moment, John looked back at that figure. And it all makes sense to John. He says to the rest of the guys who clearly hadn't clued in yet, that's that's Jesus, that's the Lord, that's the King, That's, that's what that phrase means, that's the Christ, that's Jesus. John recognized Jesus, 
And Peter's example here that carries on is fantastic. I love this. What's Peter do? Peter didn't recognize Jesus as quick as John did. But when Peter hears that it's Jesus, he realizes it's Jesus. I, I chose this, this translation that, that Henry read today because it reads so well like a story. But it, it doesn't have this one phrase that I love that you get from like the King James Version where it says, he threw himself into the sea. I love that phrase. He, it's like he just picked himself up off the boat and threw himself into the sea. I got to get there so fast. It's like somebody, it must have looked to the rest of the disciples like the hand of God picked him up and chucked him into the lake an extra 20 yards so he only had to swim 80 to get to Jesus. That is the kind of reaction that Peter has when he realizes Jesus is getting his attention. Jesus didn't say, Jesus didn't even call Peter over. Did you notice that? Jesus didn't say, hey, Peter, come here. He didn't say to any of them, come over, but when Peter realizes what's happening, he jumps in that water to get to Jesus. That is an example for all of us. When we realize Jesus is prompting us to something in our days, are we going to respond like Peter? Throw ourselves in the sea to get to Jesus, to what he is doing. So maybe you haven't heard the voice of Jesus literally telling you to come and sit and eat and rest. But that's what Jesus was beckoning the disciples into. He was ready for it. That's what he wanted. But he got their attention in that wordless call. And they responded just like they were supposed to. Jesus today is doing the same thing in each of our lives. Because Jesus is calling all of us to stop running. Stop hiding in the secular. Stop building barriers around the work that I do here and the church life I have over here and the I help out with whatever on Thursday nights or Wednesday nights or Tuesday nights. Stop compartmentalizing your life and building barriers to keep God out of my little secular hobbies. God is calling us to stop hiding in the secular and surrender our whole lives, surrender our whole lives to the call of Christ on us. He's not, for some of you maybe, but he's not telling you to go quit your secular jobs because secular is bad. He's calling you to surrender everything you do that has temporary significance so that he can infuse it with eternal significance in the relationships you make with your coworkers or with your patients or with the people who just need to have some time on an assembly line with someone who can listen, with someone who maybe doesn't like cuss and complain every other word, whatever it might be. Jesus wants to fill that purpose, that, that job in your life with purpose. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to notice this. First of all, Jesus is calling you from, from wherever you might be hiding in. He's calling you back into relationship. From the very moment that Adam and Eve hid in the garden, God was still calling to them. He knew, he knew where they were, but he, called, he invited them back. And God has been inviting, running people back ever since. God is calling you. In a dark and uncertain world, God is calling you into the certainty of His love. And as Christians, we need that reminder too, right? And as Christians, though, I want you to know today that whatever you are going to do, whether you work, eat, drink, as it says in Scripture, Do whatever you do today and tomorrow for the glory of God. Because God has a plan to use you for kingdom purposes in everything that he's called you to do this week. And to all of you, I want to remind you that Jesus is not far from you today. That God is always calling his children to himself. You know what? He does that by calling us together. How many people were in that boat? Was there one guy? There was seven. Those seven guys were not there by accident. What would have happened if John had said, I don't need fellowship with other guys? Maybe no one would have recognized Jesus. What would have happened if Peter wasn't there? None of the guys would have learned how to respond to Jesus when he calls. Where would we be without the story of Peter throwing himself in the sea and responding to Jesus that way? What about the other five guys in the boat? We don't hear what exactly happened to them in this story, but we know that all of them went out and were powerful apostles, messengers of hope 
for the gospel. And it's spread all around the world and to your family and mine today because they were in that boat, because John recognized Jesus, because Peter threw himself in the sea. God has called you together. He's put you in a boat today with a couple people. Who are those people in the boat with you? I hope you realize by now, next to nothing in the scriptures happens when people are alone. <laughs> there's, always, there's always a small group there. God loves to work and build us together as many parts making one body. We've been seeing how God is building up his church over these past few weeks. I want to take this last moment in the sermon to encourage you. God is still building up his church. He's still calling us to be together with other Christians to be together, to form us, to instruct us, so that we can have the examples of the Johns in our lives. So that we can be in a, a Peter example to somebody who needs to see us respond to Jesus today. Okay, so Peter, whoever you are out there, jump out of that boat. <laughs> Jesus is calling you. Let the people around you see that. Not for a show, but because you love Jesus so much and they need you to love Jesus in your workplace or in this church or wherever God calls you this week. Let's pray. God, thank you that you loved us first, that you were already on the shore in our lives. You were already there making provision for us, calling us. You were inviting us into relationship with you. You want us to respond to you in love and faith, just like we see in this story. You want to fill up the work that we do with meaning and purpose. You want to call us into eternal, significant work. And God, I pray that you would help all of us have ears to hear and eyes to see the way that that looks in our lives today. We praise you for your faithfulness, and we acknowledge that we have been faithless in many ways. So we call out to you, God, strengthen us by your Spirit. God, help us to do the work today that you have called all of us to do. God, I pray that you would build your kingdom, that your name would be glorified, and that we would do the little bits of work that you have called us to do today, to bring you glory, to let you draw us closer in relationship, and ultimately to be the church that you have called us to be in the world that is dark and uncertain and needs you so desperately. We all love you, Lord, and we all pray this together in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. I, would, I just invite you to stand if you're able as we sing Mighty to Save.
As we go from here today, I think that the call is clear. My reminder to you is that Jesus is the one speaking to you this week. What is he saying to you? If you're not sure where to begin, I encourage you, read this passage again. Keep going in it. See what God is up to in John 21. See what God is up to you at work tomorrow, whatever he calls you into. Let's pray. Father God, you are the one who has named us and knows us. You are the one who fills us up with meaning and purpose even when we are dry. God, I pray that you would send us out with a renewed sense of the calling that you have put in each one of us or a renewed vigor to listen and hear what you are calling us to. I pray a blessing over each person you've gathered here online. I thank you so much that you are at work and we give you the praise and the glory for everything you are going to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There is class after the message today. You're welcome to stick around. We'll be starting soon. But go in peace today, wherever you go, to love and serve the Lord.